current president of the Portsmouth Historical Society. Welcome. Tonight we're presenting a topic that is uh, both seasonally and socially relevant uh, for this time of year. My hope is that you'll learn um, things that you've never learned before. It's a topic that has not been cov covered as in depth, I think, as it should be and needs to be. And then maybe at Thanksgiving you can sound really intelligent among all your family and friends. So um, our speaker tonight is Mr. Stephen Luce. He's on the board of directors here. He grew up in Portsmouth and graduated from Portsmouth High School in 1988. He served on active, I know you're old, he served on active duty in the Army for four years, plus seven years in the Army Reserve. Um, he graduated from the University of Missouri in 1997 with a BA in psychology and a minor in history. He worked for many years in government for the state of Missouri, the city of Newport, and more recently, the town of Portsmouth. Um, in 2018, Stephen obtained his MA in history with an archaeology focus at the University of Rhode Island. He's worked on several archaeological digs, including on his property recently, and most, um, and most recently completed a survey of all the historic cemeteries in Portsmouth, along with discovering and recording several new burial grounds and markers, which we've covered, but go on our website and you can find more about them. He literally discovered a new old colonial graveyard. Two of them, I think, right? One, kind of. one yeah. kind of in Newport. So without, <laughs> I'm in Newport. Kind of. So without further ado, I introduce Stephen Luce, discussing indigenous peoples in Portsmouth during colonial times. Thank you, and thank you, Anne. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge all of the wonderful work that Anne Burns has done for the Portsmouth Historical Society. As she mentioned, she is the current president, but she will be stepping down from that role, and I'm not sure how we're going to replace her. Um, she is irreplaceable. So really quick, if everyone could give a big applause to Anne and all the work that she has done, please. Thank you. <laughs> So, my name is Stephen Luce, as um, Ann mentioned, she gave a little uh, bio of me. Um, the one thing is I went back to um, school, graduate school in 2018 at URI, and I obtained my master's in history in 2021. I wish I had gotten it in 2018 the same time I, I went in. But oh, sorry. No, that's fine. It took a few years uh, to get it. Um, I would like to uh, first say that I am going to make a few mistakes tonight. So. Please understand, um, I am not an indigenous person myself. I am going to try to um, impart some information about the history of indigenous peoples here in Portsmouth uh, during part of the colonial period. My title should probably be something more like indigenous peoples connected to the landmass currently known as Portsmouth within part of the colonial period. But that would be to come some an awkward a title. Also, you can already see my first uh, mistake. I misspelled Narragansett on um, this slide right here. So that is all me. You're going to see a lot of words that, words that are technically misspelled. And that is just the um, original spelling from the original records. Most everything I'll be discussing tonight came from colonial records written by the English. Um, a little bit of what I'll be discussing is actually a bit of oral, oral history, some things that have been told to me and, and people that I know. Now, historians normally only put stock in the written word, written history, but oral history can also be just as valid in many cases as well. Now, a quick overview, uh, a few acknowledgments. Uh, I've given, a, given one to Anne, a few more acknowledgments. I'd like to thank the uh, Mashpee Wampanoag Museum. Um, I would like to th thank Dr. Mac Scott, who is an historian and a Narragansett. And I'd like to thank uh, Lauren Spears and also anyone and everyone that has helped me along uh, this uh, journey to try to get a little information, a little more information about the indigenous peoples here in Portsmouth. I'm going to go over the historical background of the Narragansett and Wampanoag, um, including the Great Dying. Uh, we're going to go over a timeline of a Quinnick Island acquisition, talk about Prudence Island. Because when we speak about Portsmouth, Prudence Island and Hog Island quite often get left out. Um, anyone here from Prudence Island or Hog Island tonight? It's, it must be, it's so tough to get over here, right, from the ferry and such. Uh, so there will be some discussion of that. 
some of the early legislation, and that's where a lot of this information comes from. Um, the main motivation for me to do this talk tonight was two things. Number one, reading about descriptions about Native Americans here in Portsmouth that don't always shed the most positive light on their circumstances. Um, and then also uh, the motivation was a lot of people don't seem to um, know that there was a lot of interactions with the early colonists and the indigenous peoples in the first century of Portsmouth. Um, I'm going to mention uh, Mr. Jim Garman right here. He has, he has said to me a few times over the past uh, couple of years that there really weren't any indigenous peoples here in Portsmouth um, after we acquired the island. Uh, but throughout my research through the years, I knew that wasn't the case. There were so many uh, records in the town records, so many mentions. It was something that consumed the local Portsmouth colonists from the very early 1600s all the way beyond King Philip's War uh, and into the 18th century. It was a huge issue. And we're going to be talking about some of that. Uh, we'll talk about Medicom's War. So King Philip's uh, War can also be termed Medicom's War. And I prefer that term simply because by the time the war was initiated, he was no longer um, wanting to be called Philip. His uh, given name was Medicom. So Medicom's War might be more appropriate. Uh, we'll talk about the indentures of certain Native Americans, including uh, uh, Mequapew and her children, um, inquests of indigenous deaths, and the trials of Peter Mott and Job Slocum. So just really quick, here, I mean, you don't really have to take this in, but it's just a list of some of the local um, indigenous names of um, some of the tribes, some of the places, and some of the people named, some names that you might be familiar with, mm -hmm. such as Miantanomi. Um, but many names you may not be familiar with, um, you know, Pesicus, for example. Uh, the reason that these names are up here is that they are all in the records that I'm going to be going over tonight. And they all have a certain connection with, with Portsmouth. I do want to say that, well, I'm going to uh, get into that in a little bit more here in just a minute. Um, my goal here tonight is really just to try to impart, as I say, some information that you may not have already heard. And believe me, as I say, not being an indigenous person, I do not want to offend anyone. And I do hope that you ask lots of questions at the end. Uh, and I do also hope that you will have some information to share with me to help me in uh, doing this project in the future. So just a really quick uh, background information. The but before I go into that, really quick, uh, terminology that we're using here. So you notice that the title of my uh, presentation is Indigenous Peoples. Indigenous Peoples, Native Americans, American Indians, Indian. These are all terms that we've heard and used over the years. Which ones are appropriate? They're actually basically all the same. From hearing from local indigenous people, if you're not referring to them by their actual tribal name, then it's really all the same. Native American, indigenous peoples, Indian, it lumps all of them into one category as if they were one group of people. So if you know the actual tribe or nation that someone is from, if they're from the Narragansett, you say Narragansett. If you know they're from the Wampanoag, you say Wampanoag. Also, you can also just ask the person if you're actually with someone how they prefer to be um, addressed. So I'll be using all, all the terms tonight. I'll be saying Native American, I'll say indigenous people, and I, I'll even say Indian because, as I say, um, it's a little complicated. Um, some people prefer the term, some people don't. The Narragansetts, for example, the official name is Narragansett Indian Tribe. That is still their name. Um, the federal government recognizes the American Indians. They, that is the term that they use. Uh, so going back thousands of years, the ancestors of the current Narragansett and the Wampanoag have been living here in this area for thousands of years. But I'm not going to cover all that history. Uh, Ranger McNiff did a great job of that last month. Uh, so we're going forward and just giving a basic background in the early 1600s. So the two maps I have up here, the one on the left that I want to apologize for, that's not your eyes, it is that blurry. That's me taking a very bad picture. 
um, at the Mashpee uh, Wampanoag Museum. And what was, the reason I wanted to include that map is because that is their historic, that is their historic territory that they have determined through a lot of research. I don't have the uh, uh, information underneath it as you would see if you go to their museum, but based on archeological research, research based on the 17th century records, based on the language and where they find um, their people living, that is the territory on the left um, that they believe uh, is their historic territory, all the way up from beyond Boston, um, and yes, including Aquinnick Island. Now the map on the right, this was done in the 19th century, and I include this as well as a comparison. The map on the right does not have the Cape Cod as part of Wampanoag territory. I'm not sure why. But the map on the right also includes Prudence Island as part of Wampanoag territory. This is the only map that I've ever seen that. Notice that the Wampanoags themselves did not include Prudence on their map. If you could, if you could tell from that blurriness of the different colors orange. Um, so it just goes to show you a little bit of what was historically their territory that eventually changed. And also, again, a little basic information. So the Wampanoag uh, shelters were called Wetus, um, called wigwams and, and other um, cultures. Uh, both of these pictures are from the, the Mashpee Wampanoag Museum. And the Wetu that looking just like that on the inside and out is basically exactly what Europeans would have seen all throughout um, this area uh, 400, 300 years ago. And when you read Roger Williams and his interactions with Native Americans, such as Massasoit uh, Usamaquin, he's not very flattering, neither he or William Bradford, about the conditions of the Wetus. He, they describe them as very smoky and very dirty. And it's a dirt floor. And there's a fire pit right in the middle. So I can see that it would be smoky and dirty. But they're also very functional, and most likely the same type of structures are what the early colonists here would have used until they, until they built their actual homes. As I mentioned to my part earlier, I'm going to be doing a lot of Marco Rubio's uh, drinking <laughs> during this. Thank you. Um, also from the Mashpee Wampanoag Museum, um, dugout canoe. You would see hundreds of these throughout the bay um, in the 1600s. And the Wampanoag, this is how they made their canoes. They dug them out of whole, whole trees. I want to make it clear as best as possible that if you have any questions about any specific indigenous tribe or nation, such as the Wampanoag or the Narragansett or the Pequot, I encourage you to contact them directly. I am not trying to tell their story up here because I really can't tell their story. I am, at the best I can, telling the story of the English colonists and their interactions and what they wrote about the indigenous peoples here. But this type of canoe is the exact same type of canoe that would have, as I said, been used by, by thousands of uh, Native Americans and hundreds of uh, canoes here in this bay. There are Stories about, for example, um, King Philip Metacom or Metacomet taking his canoe as far as Martha's Vineyard. Can you imagine that? A dugout canoe like that all the way to Martha's Vineyard. Um, and because that, that was part of his people, the uh, uh, Wampanoag on Martha's Vineyard, they had allegiance um, to his father, to Massasoit. So occasionally he would have to visit uh, the various areas. Roger Williams would have taken a canoe, not necessarily a canoe like this, um, but took canoes going up and down um, Narragansett Bay when he came to visit Newport, for example. So a couple of the local indigenous leaders that uh, we're going to be talking about some more. On the left, um, the Massasoit Usamaquin. So we've heard of his name as Massasoit. That's really a title. Massasoit means the great sachem. His name was Usamaquin. So either way, whether you call him Massasoit, we know, you know who we're talking about, or Usamaquin, or Massasoit Usamaquin. He was the father of Metacomet, otherwise known as Philip. Now, neither one of these images are going to be accurate. Um, I personally don't know of any 
painting done of any indigenous person here in this area at the time. Um, there really should have been. I hope there is one. And hope one of you can tell me about one after, after this presentation, but I don't know of any. So all of these images are just um, imaginations by the artist, basically. So Osama Quinn, he is the one who welcomed the pilgrims in 1620. He is the one who decided to ally his tribe uh, with them. He is the one who helped the pilgrims survive that first, uh, first winter. Uh, and he was stationed, um, headquartered at Montop. So you may have heard of Montop um, Golf Course, right? And that was really the name of the village there at what we now call Mount Hope. So Mount Hope is the anglicized uh, version of Montop. And all the way from that position of power there at Montop or Mount Hope, uh, they ruled over um, their territory, which included Aquinnick Island. It included Aquinnick Island at least until perhaps 1620, if not, if not a little later than that. We'll talk about that here in just a second about how the Narragansett acquired the great island of Aquidneck. So th this is one of the spellings of Aquidneck um, that you're going to see as a different spelling that, that we're used to. It was so interesting to me that I actually started jotting down every single different spelling of Aquidneck that I found. I'm up to about 30 right now. <laughs> and as I was researching for this talk, I found about four or five more, but I had to put it to the side. Otherwise, I would have never finished you know, this lecture, these slides. And, and of course it's because you know, there was no standardized spelling, everything was phonetic, however it sounded to the ear is how they wrote it down, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, because as we look at these records and how these different names and places were written, we get a good idea of really how they were pronounced, because they were written exactly the way the English person heard them spoken. So, between roughly 1615 and 1619, there was a series of epidemics that swept through the Wampanoag territory. And it, it really, um, unfortunately, did a number. They were, um, those pandemics um, were described as miraculous plagues by John Winthrop after they occurred. Because when the English first came here and they saw all of these open um, fields, they saw all of this, um, um, land that was ready to be colonized and ready to be um, worked. They thought it was the providence of God um, that, that opened up the land for them. It was, unfortunately, something worse than that. It was something uh, more, um, more, more human, more earthly, which were a matter of diseases. Originally, it was thought to be smallpox, um, but there are, certain, there are studies now that say that was not the case and it was uh, perhaps a separate disease. But either way, these, um, that particular pandemic, and also in 1632, there was more sickness, um, really did a number on depleting the Wampanoags. So at about that time, around 1632 or a few years earlier, the weakened and depleted Wampanoags succumbed to the more abundant Narragansett in a series of battles, including the Battle of Aquidneck. So I have been looking um, for more substantial resources about this Battle of Aquidneck. And it's very difficult. So I'm putting this in the, in the realm of oral history. But I, this is something I heard years ago when I was a child growing up here. And it's also something I uh, read recently in an 1850 history book, which, as you can imagine, is not very well researched. And that is the Battle of Aquinnick happened around you know, 1620 to 1630 between the Narragansett and the Wampanoag. Because at that time, even though this island belonged to the Wampanoag, they were so depleted and so uh, uh, weakened that you know, they, couldn't, they couldn't hold it. So according to the 1850 history I just read a few weeks ago, you know, when I was trying to find a really good source for this, the battle happened three and a quarter miles north of the townhouse, uh, colony house in Newport, um, to the, uh, just by the West Road in a swampy area. So I actually drove that a couple weeks ago to find out exactly where that would take me. I knew roughly where it would be in middle of time, but I wasn't positive. And it takes you right to uh, basically where Barnes & Noble is, where Michael's is. So behind that, that shopping center, I know there is a bit of a low sort of a wet swampy area. I've never been back there myself, but 
according to at least this um, history from 1850, that's where this final battle took place, that the Narragansett were able to defeat the Wampanoag to uh, have full control of the island. Now this, you definitely don't have to read this all, and I do apologize. As I was doing this, I kind of violated one of the rules of presentations, of lectures, which is you're not supposed to put much words on a slide, because once you do, the audience tends to just start reading and not listen to the speaker. Well, I'm hoping that there's so much words up there, you won't even bother looking at that, and you'll just kind of listen to me, and I'm basically just going to you know, quickly you know, read up uh, some of them. The, the point of this is that the acquisition of this island um, from the Narragansett was not a one and done deal. You know, growing up, this is how I heard this, that you know, we bought the island fairly. We bought it, it was done and over with, and you know, that was it. That wasn't the situation. From the Narragansett's point of view, from Miantinomi and Canonicus's point of view, they were allowing these Englishmen, allowing Coddington and others to settle on the island because that's what the sachems did. They distributed um, you know, the use of land, uh, which is their basis of their power. Uh, they didn't have power by um, you know, basically you know, by conquering in the European sense. They had their authority by helping others, by being the best help who can help everyone in the village and tribe the best. And they looked at, at Coddington and the English as just another group of people that might be able to help them. So these things that were paid for the island were just gratuities. Uh, and this isn't just my opinion. I'm going to show you a slide in just a second. Roger Williams himself is going to say this very same thing. So as I say, growing up, I was told that uh, we acquired this island, you know, you know, you know very much in, in, in a fair and a fair payment. But what kind of fair payment is this when 40 fathoms of white beads, 10 coats, and 20 hoes? Um, is that really going to pay for this entire island? So the white beads were, were for um, Canonicus and Mantinomi, and to be clear, Canonicus was the main sachem of the Narragansett. Mantinomi was his nephew, he was the minor sachem, and the Narragansett always had that, um, that setup of two sachems, a major and a minor one. So Connington in 1637 first came and spoke with Wanamantinomi. I hope I said that right, Wanamantinomi. And you've heard of that golf course as well, too, right? Wanamontanomi. If you go on the Wanamontanomi golf course website, it'll say that Wanamontanomi was the governor of this island. It's not really, it's not correct. He was a sachem on this island in the early 1600s. Not the only one. Um, not the sole one. Because on the fourth line down, you see Wanamontanuit was also a sachem of Aquidneck. And during this transaction in 1637, he received five fathoms of wampum. So when Connington first came to um, Wanamatanomi, uh, he told Connington that, no, I'm sorry, I don't have the authority to deal with you um, with this great island here. You have to go speak with Connecticut and Antinomi. Um, they are the top sachems of, of our tribe. And so he did. And Canonicus and uh, Mantinomi were, were quite on board with this uh, arrangement uh, from their point of view. Again, from their point of view, they're allowing a few English people to live on the island, to work the land, to be allies to them. Okay? Um, and, but from the English point of view, it was a sale, done and over with. Now please get off our island. So, just really quick on some of the... Um, um, And I just want to point out, so notice all the way down to the very bottom, November 1639, Miantinomi receives 23 coats, 13 hoes, and two tar keeps. We have no idea what tar keeps are. Uh, some people think they're hatchets. To distribute to the Indians that did inhabit of the island of Quinnick, and full of all promises, debts, and demands for the said island. So in 1637, if you read that deed, it says basically payment in full. Two years later, the English are still trying to say, payment in full. After two years of giving all of these coats and hoes and wampum, 
to all of these um, sachems and inhabitants, the English are really hoping that by now they have full control of this island. Quick reference, so I just want to point out, um, these are just random things. Some of these are random. A lot of this is going to be in chronological order, and that's what I'm kind of going with, so we're kind of up to 1640 right now. But I'll be going back and forth a little bit as well. So 1640, there's a reference regarding the boundary between Portsmouth and Newport, now Middletown, on West Main Road. And I paraphrase it, but this is, when, I have, when you see the three dots, you know, that means that there was text in between, but it's not pertinent to what I'm trying to say. But everything else is straight um, from the records. So when it says, Brook to the hunting wigwam, now standing on the highway between the two towns, the bounds between the two towns. So after Coddington and, and some people went south to Newport, they found Newport. Um, a year later, 1640, Newport and Portsmouth had to decide where the boundary was going to be. So the boundary started, it, it's exactly where it is now between Portsmouth and Newport. So it started on the, um, the southeast uh, side and then it went uh, northwest uh, to West Main Road, basically where Prescott Farm is right now. So, so what I'm trying to point out right here is that right at West Main Road where Prescott Farm is right now, there was a hunting wigwam in 1640 sure what that was about and how long that hunting wigwam was there and whether it was something that just the Narragansetts used or the English as well. So this is Roger Williams and Roger Williams said this a couple times not just in June 1638 um, but he said it years later as well. This is what Roger Williams said to John Winthrop. Sir, concerning the islands of Prudence and Aquidneck, neither of them was sold properly for a thousand Fathom would not have bought either by strangers. The truth is not a penny was demanded for either, and what was paid was only gratuity, though I chose for better assurance and form to call it sale. So Roger Williams knew that he and Coddington didn't really buy this island. He knew that it was just a gift um, from Canonicus and Antinomy. But, so the English had it in their mind that it was their island for better form and assurance, he called it a sale. So right away, this is gonna start a lot of problems, um, I'm thinking, um, I don't know about you, so when Ann Hutchinson and, and, and Connington and them came, they thought they were coming to an island that they owned outright. But the Native Americans had a different idea of that and Roger Williams even knew it was different than that. So that started months and years of conflict um, between the indigenous peoples of this area and the colonists here in Portsmouth. Um, you may th think, like I thought when I was younger, that 1620 to 1675, everything was happy and peace between the colonists and the, and the Native Americans. It wasn't until that, that uh, belligerent King Philip started a war, it's his war, right, that things went south. It's not the case. There was, there was friction all the way through and it just kept building and building and building. So just uh, a little quick, uh, you know, stepping back and talking about Prudence Island. Uh, Chibakawisa, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying my best. So the Native American uh, name for Prudence Island, Chipakawisa. Now, Kanonikis and Mantanomi originally gave Chipakawisa to Mr. Oldham on the condition that he moved there. Having failed this, they gave the same deal to Roger, uh, Roger Williams. Uh, Williams accepted half the island with the other half reserved for John Winthrop. Though he expressed, though Roger Williams expressed a desire to build a home and live there, it does not appear that he ever did. So this is interesting because it shows again how the Native Americans were trying to assist the English and trying to ally themselves with the English, trying to befriend them by giving them land with the promise that they move to the land and work the land and use the land and be part of their community. There is um, the doc Dr. Max Scott, the Narragansett, um, who's, a, who's a historian, has a PhD in history, um, who I got some of this information from. I'm paraphrasing what he said to me. And basically what he said was, Prior to 1675, that's Metacom's war, the English were living 
in Narragansett Nation. After 1675, the Narragansett were living in an English colony. Uh, yet still, <clears throat> oh, well, before we go to that, so here on Prudence Island is uh, something called Pulpit Rock. On this rock, Roger Williams preached to the Indian inhabitants of Prudence Island. I've been to Prudence Island a couple times. I did not know this rock was there. I have never seen it. Um, I don't know if Roger Williams actually preached um, there as this says, but he may have. Um, not sure, not sure uh, on the full history of that, but want to include it because I want to include as much as possible the pertinent information regarding indigenous peoples with their connection to Portsmouth. And this is a very bad picture. Cleft Rock, a curious array of stone on Prudence Island. So according to this um, local Prudence Island gentleman um, from early 20th century, around 1910, he believes that this rock is where Miantinomia and Canonicus um, had their seat on Prudence Island. It's interesting reading the article that this newspaper is from because it also mentions that every historian around the block was finding Miantinomia and Canonicus seat on every rock everywhere on every island. It's like, oh, here's a big rock. This is, must be where he held court and sat. Now, I wouldn't doubt that Canonicus and Miantinomi, um had a special place that they would want to be to, to hold their court uh, on every island that was part of their territory. Um, here on the Quinnick Island, we have Miantinomi Hill that we say that that's where Miantinomi had his, um, held his seat. So this probably um, could very well be uh, where they were. It's an interesting looking rocket. I'd really like to see it in person because it looks like there's an arch there. Um, it looks like two large standing stones with an, with an arch in between them. So I wonder if it's still there. Also on Prudence Island, we have the Old Indian Spring. Now, I don't know if this is still there as well. This postcard, this picture is from a postcard from over 100 years old. And of course, um, the, I wanted to, and the Native Americans would not have had this concrete structure the way you see it. Um, so this would have been the colonists um, just using the spring area. But still, uh, it's a bit of a connection with uh, the old Chipacawisa. Now here is one that I really tried to paraphrase for everybody. So this is fun. So this is the, some of the things that the Portsmouth officials were saying to the Native Americans. No fires on the island. No traps. Do not kill any boar. And now I'm paraphrasing, but I encourage you all to read these records. It's so fun and so interesting, and they use such colorful language. Do not take or destroy deer or cattle. Do not be unruly. Do not take any canoe, Englishman's canoes. Do not break any contracts. Do not loiter. Do not come to our homes. Do not fall any trees upon the islands. What, am I, what, what can I do? Do not peel any trees upon the islands. What that refers to is peeling the bark off the trees to use the bark uh, for their wheatus and wigwams. Do not trade or barter with the French or Dutch. Do not skulk about the island. I, I love that one there. It, it basically says, if there are any Indians skulking in the woods, if you find any in the Indians skulking about the woods looking suspicious, you can, you can grab them and bring them and uh, detain them. Uh, do you not sell, give, deliver, or any other way convey any powder, shotgun, pistol, sword, or any other engine of war to the Indians? So that last one was for the English colonists. Um, and roughly these were between 1640 and 1647. It didn't get any better after that. And several of these were repeated several times over the next 30, 40 years. For example, the uh, prohibition about um, having uh, weapons, for example, the penalties just increased um, each time they wrote them down again. Now this is a fun one that I like only because of the great controversy we have now with the coyotes on the island. So this island, like all of North America, was filled with wolves uh, for thousands of years. Uh, wolves had no natural predator. Uh, wolves hate coyotes. The wolves would keep the coyotes sequestered in the southwest. Uh, you remember from Bugs Bunny the Roadrunner, the coyotes belong in the southwest and that's where they were for thousands of years. But when Europeans came to the land, they, they killed and got rid of the wolves because wolves and European settlement do not go along very well. Wolves will, will, will eat the, you know, 
uh, crops, or basically they'll, they'll attack the domesticated animals. Um, and they also uh, will scare and hurt and sometimes even kill you know, young children or, or older people. So uh, the English first asked uh, the Native Americans in 1642, Roger Williams was given authority to consult and agree with Mantanomi, sachem of Narragansett, for the destruction of the wolves that are now upon the island. But in no way does this allow you to also kill deer. So I'm paraphrasing um, uh, what the law actually said, but it's just interesting how they made sure they went out of their way to say, oh yeah, remember we told you you can't kill any deer? You still can't kill any deer. Come on the island and kill the wolves, but that's it, no deer. And so now we have an island full of coyotes because there are no wolves to, to keep them away. Now I'm mentioning um, this, what happened to Anne Hutchinson, because Anne Hutchinson, of course, is a great connection to Portsmouth. As you all know, um, you know she is considered the, you know, the first woman to found a town here in America. Um, she did not sign the Portsmouth Compact you know, being a woman. Um, her husband, uh, William, did. Um, but in 1640, uh, one or two, uh, and, and most of her children uh, moved out to New Netherland, uh, which was controlled by the Dutch at the time. She had to get farther away from uh, John Winthrop because she kept fearing uh, for, that she would be persecuted even more, more than she had been. She had a lot of children. Anne Hutchinson had 15 children. Now at this time, by this time, I think one or two were already adults. Uh, I believe 12 or 13 of the children, um, I, I don't even want to imagine a number. I don't want to guess at the number. She definitely had 15 children. Not all 15 were in New Netherlands at this time of this attack. So William Keefe was the leader of New Netherland, and he ordered an attack against the, the, the Lenape without approval, without approval from his council and without approval of um, the Dutch colonists. The Sawani allied themselves with the Lenape after, after this attack, and they counterattacked. And Anne Hutchinson and most of her family were killed as a result. I say most of her family because her husband, William, had already died and was buried here in Portsmouth. Oldest son was, you know, didn't go with her. But during this attack, one daughter, Susanna, uh, was out picking berries. And Susanna, um, she survived uh, the initial attack and then when the Sowani warriors found her, they did not kill her, they, they kidnapped her. It's guessed that maybe they did not kill her because she was a redhead, and they might have seen that as uh, a positive omen, perhaps. Um, but they did not kill her. The reason I had the words alarm there is because in our Portsmouth records, um, we did it first, I believe it was 1639, and then Newport did it in 1640. They have to, um, go ahead and deal with any possible incursion on the island. So if there was any, ever any um, possibility of something happening, um, the French are attacking or the Native Americans are coming across uh, to attack, they would have the designated person run throughout the town yelling, alarm, alarm, and beating a drum incessantly after firing three separate musket shots. Now, it takes a couple minutes to fire each musket shot, so I can't imagine this was a very quick, efficient way to, to get people to realize that you know, there's an attack. But I just thought that that was quite interesting, um, that that's the way they did it. They certainly had to, right? They didn't have any other means. They didn't have any bullhorns. They didn't have any phones, so nothing more than people running around yelling alarm. Now, a few um, um, little uh, bits of information from the records. And I have these here just to show how things are changing. So we're going from a majority indigenous population, thousands of indigenous people, and just a handful of English, and gradually that completely changes within 50, 60 years. And I'll show you later, by 1680, there were about 70,000 English in New England and only 7,000 uh, Native Americans. And those figures were completely reversed you know, a few decades before that. So this is just showing some of those changes. So in March of 1644, after just 
six years after um, Portsmouth was founded, um, Usamaquin, that's Massasoit Usamaquin, uh, was given permission with 10 men um, to kill 10 deer only within the liberty of Portsmouth. And the deer had to be brought um, to town so Mr. Branton and Mr. Bolston could view them. I guess they didn't trust Usamaquin, the great Massasoit himself, who helped them get this island, who helped the pilgrims for years. They wanted to make sure that um, they only took you know, the 10 deer that they were authorized, and then to depart from the island within five days. So it was very nice of the colonists, on the one hand, to even allow this. But still, it's just odd. It's, it's odd in a couple, a couple reasons, a couple um, reasons why. Were there no longer any deer around Montop? Um, by this time, perhaps things were already getting um, um, squeezed a little bit. There was already some pressure. Uh, for him to have to ask, almost with hat in hand, asking the Portsmouth town officials, hey, is it okay if we get a few deer from Portsmouth? It just shows how the relationship is, is changing. And the fact that the Portsmouth officials felt it necessary to actually write this down as an act, as an order, as a law, instead of just saying, yeah, sure, go ahead. But no, everything had to be um, to the letter. The very next month, um, which is a very interesting uh, and a very sad, a very sad um, event. April 1644, this act indeed of the voluntary, voluntary and free submission of the chief sachem and the rest of the princes with the whole people of the Narragansetts unto the government protection of that honorable state of old England signed by Pesachus, Canonicus, and Mixon. So this is when the Narragansetts allegedly, voluntarily, completely gave up their sovereignty to the English. I mean, submitted themselves under the rule of uh, the King of England. From the English point of view, that's exactly what they did. And that's why everything that happens after this, every infraction that a Native American, indigenous person um, commits, the English saw that as it, they had the right to impose their laws, their judgments. It's like, oh, don't you remember? You submitted yourself to the English authority back in 1644. Now, if you actually read the full contents of this, there's so much legalese in there, and we're going to have trouble you know, making sense of it today. I mean, how do you think with a different language, um, with, with people who were not familiar with these terms uh, or our language um, actually understood about this? Um, a few months later, it's ordered that all the Indians in the town, town of Portsmouth, so just about everything I'm going to be talking about, I'm talking about here is dealing with Portsmouth. That is the whole point of this um, lecture. But some of the items um, happen for the entire island. Some things are applied to the entire island, which at this time was just Newport and Portsmouth. Um, so in the town, uh, all the Indians in the town shall depart forthwith to live in the woods with their effects. If they appear again, they shall forfeit. And it goes on to say what they're going to forfeit. So a couple things about this. I th Do you remember from that, that slide um, in 1639, uh, Antinomi was given some, some hose and such to, for, his, for the inhabitants to leave the island? Um, he was given some wampum a year or two before that for his, for his pain and travels and getting um, the Indians off the island. Apparently, they're not off the island. Um, so they never, they never were at this time. As much as the English had hoped that they would have uh, been off the island, they, ne they never were. Um, and it shows up in all of these laws. You have to understand, these laws were created not in a vacuum. They were created because of a need. If there were no Indians on the island, there would be no need to have a law that says they need to get out of town and go live in the woods. And on to 1650, it's ordered that Pesachus shall have liberty to get so many chestnut. I don't know this word, but this is exactly from the record rhymes, R-Y-E-N-S, upon the common of the island as may cover him a wigwam, provided he take John Green with him, that no wrong may be done to any particular person upon the island. So again, now Pesachus at this time is the Narragansett sachem. He is the leader of the Narragansett, and from his point of view, these English are his people living in his territory. Um, 
And he probably never even saw this act. He just went and said, hey, I need to get some um, chestnut bark uh, for a wigwam. Um, okay. But we're going to write it down, and we're going to make sure we keep uh, an eye on you as well. So, again, it just shows the, the change in the relationship from one group of people in charge to, to the new group. And just the very last one. Now, this is, now this is a good one because this keeps coming up. So May 1667 ordered that the Indians residing upon the island shall be forthwith disarmed of all sorts of arms. Now this uh, is a gun person's worst nightmare here in America. The authorities are literally coming to take away your armaments. And this wasn't the first time, was it? We saw those other acts from the 1640s that says do not sell or convey in any way any pistols or shot to these Indians. Um, and here we are 20 years later, and it is still an issue. And it continues to be an issue. Now this, as I say, we're gonna, I'm going to read this, and you can, just, you can listen, or you can read along with me. This was written by Samuel Gorton, 1652. It is the first anti-slavery slavery law in America. Um, at the time, Sam Gorton also a uh, resident of Portsmouth originally, uh, not originally, but at one time. Sam is such a fantastic character. I, I encourage all of you to learn about Sam Gorton because he has such a fascinating life. And he was all, always getting in trouble with the authorities. Um, here in Portsmouth, we had him whipped and kicked out of town. And anyways, he ended up fairly well. He ended up being president of um, um, Providence and Warwick for a year. So the law states, Whereas there is a common course practiced amongst English men to buy enslaved Africans to the end that they may have them for service or slaves forever, for the preventing of such practices among us, let it be ordered that no black mankind or white being forced by covenant bond or otherwise to serve any man or as assigned longer than 10 years or until they come to be 24 years of age if they be taken in under 14 from the time of their coming within the liberties of this colony. Uh, this is going to be important later, too. The, the, I hope you're taking notes. There's going to be a big quiz on this at the end. <laughs> so no more than 10 years of servitude in general, or more than 10 years if they um, are, are placed uh, bef you know, uh, before the age of 14. And, and at the end, End, of, end or term of 10 years to set them free as the manner is with the English servants. And that man that will not let them go free or shall sell them away elsewhere to that end that they may be enslaved to others for a long time, he or they shall forfeit to the colony 40 pounds. That is a hefty fine uh, back then. It's been often said that this law was not followed. Um, we know that Newport was the largest or one of the largest um, slave ports um, during colonial times. Um, especially in the 18th century. So at some point in the 18th century, I would say this law was definitely ignored and no longer followed. But from the research and from a few other things I'm going to show you here, I believe it was followed at least for a few decades, at least into the, in the 17th century. For example, 11 years later, on August 1st, 1663, Gabriel Jennings, was indentured to William Wodell for 14 years and two months by his parents. At the end of his term, he was promised two suits of apparel, one cow and one mare foal weanable. However, if the said Gabriel should be taken away by death within two years of the end of his term, then Mr. Wodell will deliver a cow or a, or a mare foal. So William Wardell from Portsmouth um, he was a weaver based on one source I've seen. He is going to obtain um, and acquire and buy many people um, over the next uh, couple decades. But he starts out with English because at this time, that's basically all there is. Uh, after the Pequot War of 1637, many of the Pequot were enslaved, but not here in Rhode Island because Rhode Island did not, did not take part in the Pequot War. So during the 1630s and 40s and 1650s, I don't know offhand of any Native Americans that were 
enslaved or indentured. It's just not even something that I think would have come up. Um, so at this time, if you need help, if you're going to um, get someone who's indentured, it's going to be an English person. And the process of being indentured, it's a common practice. It was a common practice among the English at this time. And it's definitely different from what's called chattel slavery, much different. When practiced like this, when practiced like it was practiced with Gabriel Jennings, uh, he knew what he was getting into. His um, indenture, well, to be fair, he um, was probably only nine years and 10 months old at this time. So he really you know, couldn't commit to this, but both of his parents did. And as I say, it was pretty normal back then to do that. The reason to do it is you're a bit of a poor family. You want an opportunity for your child. And so you indenture your child to someone who can raise them, who can feed them and shelter them and clothe them and help them learn a trade. And then at the end of that term, they'll even have something substantial, whether it be money or a cow or some new clothes. But we're going to see a little bit later that that didn't quite apply to non-English. So before we get there, though, really quick, um, talking about, I had to throw in Hog Island a little bit. So Hog Island was acquired by, by Portsmouth from Wham Sutter um, in 1654. Wham Sutter was the oldest uh, son of Massasoit Usamaquin. Wham Sutter uh, took over the sachemship um, after his father Massasoit died in 1660, I believe. Uh, and, but he was only sachem for one year. Wham Sutter, um, also known as Alexander, um, died after just a year. And Philip, Metacom, thought he was poisoned. Um, you know, not really sure. Those names really quick, let me just mention those. So it was not meant in a derogatory way. Calling Philip, Philip or, Al, or Wham Sutter Alexander was not meant in any any way other than um, absolute respect. Massasoit asked the English for English names for his sons. What are, what are some good English names that I can give my two oldest sons? And I'm not positive offhand, I believe it was William Bradford um, who, gave, who provided the names, Alexander for Alexander the Great and Philip for Philip of Mastodon. Um, Philip was the father of Alexander the Great. So that's where those names come from. Um, now, William Ballston, John Porter, and John Briggs were chosen and authorized to dispute with any opposers to maintain the town's right in Hog Island. So that seems to be a whole story in and of itself, um, that there was, there was much dispute as to who really controlled or owned Hog Island for a number of years. Um, but, and it necessitated the creation of this law, 1657, um, to, so that Portsmouth could uh, defend their rights to it. Now, a little bit after that, um, and this is why I put this um, beginning of Hog Island with um, um, this other statement on the left. So this I find very fun. Uh, where I worked in Portsmouth was in the town clerk's office. So it would have been my responsibility to type up this letter. Um, this isn't the actual letter, this is the order for the letter. So Philip, Sachem of Mount Hope, have put several swine on Hog Island therein, intruding on the rights of this town. It is ordered that a letter shall be drawn up by the town clerk to forewarn the said Philip from any further proceeds in that nature. And also forthwith to remove such swine or other cattle he hath put on the said island. So you know how close Hog Island is to, to Bristol, to Montauk. I mean, this is Philip's backyard. All the colonists were doing this. This is why the island got its name, Hog Island. This is what you did. You brought your hogs and goats to Goat Island, Newport. You brought your hogs to Hog Island here because you wanted them to be away from your crops. You wanted them to be quarantined in some area on a small island they are, and they could just run free. Um, you mark your hogs, your swine in the air with your specific mark, and um, only the English were allowed to do that. The um, Native Americans were told uh, specifically they couldn't do that. That was a whole catch-22 situation with the hogs. Um, and we could talk so long about this, but in general, everything was being taken away from them. If I can no longer hunt deer because there aren't any deer, 
or because they're on your land and you don't want me going on your land, what can I do? I will, I will buy some of your hogs and swine. You know, we brought hogs over here, hogs who are not native to, the, to this land. Um, but, the, but the Native Americans um, love them. Why wouldn't they? Whoever loves bacon, you can understand. It's a, it's a very tasty thing. Um, so Philip was not doing anything different than, uh, than the English were doing. The problem was he wasn't English. And this is what caused this letter to be sent. We don't know what happened. Uh, this is the order for the letter. The letter was drawn up by the town clerk and was sent to him. Um, I also, also wonder how the postage ran back then. <laughs> you know, you get on the ferry there, you know, where the bridge is now, and you take the boat over to Montop, Mont and I don't know, you just walk into the village and just say, this is for Philip. But, um, but yeah, we don't know the results. Since there was no other act mentioned after this, it's likely Philip complied and took the hogs off the island. So as of 1675, roughly, um, this would be the nature of um, the territories. So here in the, uh, the lower right, uh, in the green, is the Wampanoag. And that kind of orange color would be the English colony of Plymouth. Uh, above that would be the English colony of Massachusetts. And then here is our little colony of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations in that very light kind of white color, with the Narragansetts uh, to the west and the Nick Nipmuc up in the northwest. So as Metacom's war was breaking out, this is roughly um, what the territories look like. All right. So I did a couple years ago in college an entire lecture on uh, King Philip's War, Metacom's War. Um, so you're not going to get all that tonight, but you're going to get this little bit of a summary here. So Metacom may have negotiated a truce with the leaders of Portsmouth during the war, or before the war, uh, since there were many pacifists um, from the Society of Friends slash Quakers, and Philip had more grievance with the mainland English. I say many um, Quakers. There probably weren't many Quakers as of 1675. Um, the first ones came over here in the 1660s. Um, but they did grow very rapidly here in Portsmouth. And they were complete pacifists. Uh, to be a true Quaker, a true society of friends, uh, you do not have um, um, American flags or Christian flags on, on your church um, because you should respect the actual substance of what those things represent rather than um, the symbol. And you don't um, enslave people and you don't kill people. So, um, so it's very possible that, um, that Philip did speak with the Portsmouth leaders um, at some point to sort of come to a mutual um, um, neutrality between the two. Uh, but regardless, no attacks occurred on Aquinnick Island during the 14 months of Metacom's war. The 14 months of Metacom's war was from June 1675 to August 1676 here in southern New England. The war continued for at least two more years up north, um, very violently with the Abenaki um, up in Maine and such. So the war was throughout New England and it, it, and it did continue even beyond um, uh, Metacom's death. Uh, the island the Quinnick Island here became a refuge, actually, for those English fleeing Providence and other attacked towns. Providence was burned. Uh, as Mr. Zillian can uh, attest to, he wrote a good article about that. <laughs> and many of the um, refugees from Providence came here to the island. Benjamin Church and others from the Great Swamp Massacre um, actually recovered from their wounds here in Newport. Um, after after Benjamin Church and the other English um, finished their killings of hundreds of women and children and a few, and a few warriors, um, it was cold. Um, they could have very easily stayed in the, in the Narragansett Fort at the Great Swamp, and they would have stayed warm, but they refused to stay in these Native Americans' filthy you know, wigwams. Um, and so they braved the freezing cold um, from basically where URI is now to, to Wickford. And many of their, their wounded actually died along the way, um, unnecessarily. 
But those that did survive that um, came over here to Newport, um, or specifically to Newport, um, you know, to uh, recover from those wounds. So August of 1671, just give you a little bit of a timeline. Um, and these are all, as I said, I'm trying to connect all of these here with Portsmouth. So a council of war um, from both, and specifically the references, the town councils of Newport and Portsmouth and the councils of war of Newport and Portsmouth, both. Um, they met at George Lawton's house, George Lawton's house right here in Portsmouth, um, right by the Lawton Cemetery, by the reservoir. Uh, on the little section of Old West Main Road uh, between the reservoir and, uh, and the new West Main. So they met there to secure, um, to find out the best ways for securing the inhabitants and their estates in these times of imminent danger. So 1671, imminent danger. Minna comes forward and start for another four years, but already imminent danger. But this imminent danger had been going on for years, from the 1660s, uh, when they were, when the English were disarming the Native Americans. So this had just been building and building and building. It's like a powder keg. Um, April 1675, boats were ordered to patrol um, the bay for island defense with a third of the men from Portsmouth. So they started out with at least four boats. Now, I don't know how well, four boats that contain at least five men each, five to six men each. So 24 men in four boats patrolling around a Quinnick Island. This is a big island. If you ever have been in a boat to try to go around it or even drive around it, um, within this legislation, it says if you need more, by all means, you know, go ahead and get more. But start out with four boats. So um, I'm not sure how effective that was. Um, perhaps at the end of the war, they they patted themselves on the back because there were no incursions. There were no there was no invasion by the Native Americans. But honestly, um, you know, they had their hands full with attacking the mainland towns. There were so many mainland towns to attack um, and if the people of Portsmouth were willing to stay neutral and not attack them, there you go. March 1676, um, the inhabitants um, here in Portsmouth are ordered to sell and send their Indian men and women from this town. So before this, they weren't even supposed to have any, yet they're still here. It's, it's, it's very confusing. Um, um, I mean, it's not so confusing. I mean, we know, I mean, the point is that they never went away. They were always here on the island throughout all of this. Um, and that's also one of the main things that I need to mention right now that perhaps I, I should have mentioned in the beginning. It'll be, I'll mention it toward the end, which is they are still here. It's one of the things that um, each indigenous person I've spoken with when I asked if there's one thing you would want me to make sure I tell people, you know, what is that, that we're still here. They never went away. Um, their numbers may have dwindled and gone down, um, but they're still here of, of each tribe, the Narragansett, the Wampanoag, and even other tribes that aren't officially recognized. This one I always found very interesting. April 1676, 100 acres in Portsmouth were set aside for refugees from the mainland, uh, mostly from Providence, I, I believe. So that was just something to, you know, help them out. We, Portsmouth had this influx of, you know, hundreds of people coming, um, escaping the, the, the terrors of, uh, of Medicom's war, and um, they needed a place to live, they needed land to till, they needed to be able to, to grow their own food. So that specific order uh, was for two years um, to till the land. August 1676, uh, so we come to the end of King uh, Philip's war, or Metacom's war here in southern New England. Benjamin Church and others ride north from Newport. They are led to Philip by a disgruntled warrior, and then John Alderman shoots Philip. So Benjamin Church was recovering in Newport um, from his wounds, and a disgruntled warrior, Philip, came to the island. The reason he was disgruntled is, is pretty um, understandable. He went to Philip Medicom and said, please, you should sue for peace. I'm sorry. His brother went to Philip, went to Medicom and asked Medicom to sue for peace. Medicom killed him. So now the brother of the one Medicom killed is now understandably upset with Medicom. You just killed my brother just because he asked you to sue for peace. So that brother now turned on Medicom 
came over. Um, you know, first he had to come, first he came to the ferry area, and basically, I don't know what they do. They throw up a signal, hi, can I come over? So he's on the Bristol side, he's on Montauk side, um, asking to come over um, to the island. He was allowed to come over. He had to go see uh, Benjamin Church in Newport, he goes to Newport, and he tells Benjamin, I know where Philip is, and I can lead you right to him. So Philip said, okay, let's go. I'm sorry. Um, Church, Benjamin Church said, okay, let's go. Benjamin Church is considered America's first ranger, actually, because Benjamin Church actually used many of the fighting tactics, the guerrilla tactics that the Native, American, Native Americans used. So he used their own tactics against them to help defeat them in a lot of these battles. Um, so Benjamin Church, a couple dozen um, of English uh, soldiers, along with this disgruntled uh, uh, warrior, and John Alderman. Um, they traveled uh, north from Newport, so they go through Portsmouth, across uh, the ferry, into Montauk. Now, John Alderman was a Native American who was originally, I believe, a Pocasset uh, with Weedamu. Uh, but then he switched sides um, to the English. So there was a prophecy that uh, Medicom was told many years before this that he would never be killed by an Englishman. And that prophecy came true because John Alderman, the Native American, is the one that actually shot Medicom in August 1676. Uh, Medicom was drawn and quartered. Um, there are various stories as to what happened to his head. One story that John Alderman had his head, another story the head was sent to Plymouth and put on a spike where it remained for many, many years. Um, and John Alderman, it was said, had one of Medicom's hands and kept it in a jar and charged people a fee to, to have a look at it. Uh, very gruesome, but you hear similar things throughout the Old West. Clearly it's a uh, practice that, that happened. Why yes? Yes, the, the, the savagery and atrocities were on both sides uh, quite, uh, quite much. Um, and it was all about revenge on both sides. You, you hurt me and, and I hurt you. You, you attack uh, my, my friends over here like the, they did in New Netherlands. Now we're going to attack uh, your colony. Absolutely. Now, um, as I say, the war here in southern New England was over in 1676. And just a little figure I mentioned earlier, by 1680, there were 68,000 um, English living in New England and only 7,000 indigenous. Now, this is a connection with Medicom's war. And there's a connection with Portsmouth and here at the Portsmouth Historical Society. So this is the headstone um, for Susanna Eldred in storage right downstairs, right beneath us. She died December 1675 um, here in Portsmouth, age 14 months. Her family was from North Kingstown. And so the theory, the opinion, is that her family left North Kingstown during Medicom's War for safety reasons and came here to Portsmouth. Um, and so that's why they were here, even though they're from North Kingstown. So she, Susanna Eldred, was the great-granddaughter of Anne Hutchinson. Um, she's the granddaughter of Susanna Hutchinson, the only survivor from that August 1643 attack. So I find that fascinating. That um, I wish we knew where she was buried so we could put her stone back, but at the very least we do have her headstone um, you know, downstairs, and that's that connection there. So yes, because of uh, Susanna surviving uh, that attack, she was ev er um, eventually um, ransomed back um, to the English shop. I don't recall who she was exchanged for. All right. How much longer do you think we should talk here? <laughs> You guys okay for 10 more minutes? Take it to eight o'clock? All right. Yeah, we started a little bit late, right? All right, so um, perpetual slavery for Hannah, an Indian woman, that she was willing to enter into. So here we go from this um, same William Wardell, who you remember earlier um, gave Gabriel Jennings a really good deal. Here's what he does for Hannah. 
Um, after Hannah was sold by Adam, well, she was sold by Adam to William uh, because she was, she was um, taken captive um, in Metacom's war. Actually, a bill of sale was given that was signed and sealed by Benjamin Church himself. And, but here's, the, to me, the most interesting thing. After she was... So you remember the 1652 law by Sam Gorton. You cannot be enslaved perpetually forever. Only 10 years, right? If you're over 14 years old, 10 years at the most. The way that law was written, if, uh, if you recall, is you can't be forced to do that. The English can't. But if you willingly do it, it's okay. So a year after this sale of Hannah to William Wardell, the weaver here in Portsmouth, someone must have noticed that discrepancy that, wait a minute, this, um, you can't enslave someone perpetually forever. So a year later, in 1678, they had Hannah sign uh, where they wrote, the above-named Indian woman doth hereby declare that she is willing to be servant to the above-named William Ward in manner and form above, meaning forever. Um, now, this is also the woman who most likely was brought to William Wardell by John Alderman. So in a way, from John Alderman's point of view, he was helping her. He was helping her escape a, a worse fate. So I guess Adam Wright of Duxbury would not have been a good master for her to be enslaved to. So John Alderman actually helped bring Hannah to William Wardell. Um, perhaps because it was a better um, circumstance than being with that Adam Wright of Duxbury. We're almost done here, actually. Kind of. <laughs> now, on April 27, 1678, Portsmouth officials disposed of three Pocasset Wampanoags. At the end of their terms, they were given freedom from their servitude, but nothing else. So that's just the biggest thing I, I want to point out to you right here, is that whereas... Gabriel Jennings received the cow and the two suits and the mare. All Mequapu got for her three-year uh, indenture was her freedom. All her 15-year-old daughter, Hannah, I'm sorry, all her six-year-old daughter, Hannah, received after 15 years of indenture was her freedom. The only thing... 14-year-old Peter received after his 10 years indenture, what was it? Freedom. His freedom. That's it. If you can imagine working with someone for 10, 15 years, and at the end of that time, you have nothing. You're not given a, any clothes. You're not given a cow. So what option do you have other than maybe voluntarily indenture yourself again for another 10 years? Uh, now, these years, 10 years and... Um, and 15 years for Hannah because she was only six years old, these conform to that 1652 law. No more than 10 years if you're over 14, there's Peter, and as long as you want, up to age 24 if you're under 14. Just to throw out another one here to see that this continued on, and it wasn't just William as well. So to show you that it wasn't just William not willing to give anything to his Native American indentures, um, and that it continued beyond, you know, 1670s. Here's uh, Indian Sam, uh, who also, just one little quote I took from his indenture, shall not by night or by day absent himself from his said master's services. It's interesting the little things that were written in there that um, they had to make sure they did or didn't do. But the same thing, after the end of um, his, uh, he was granted his freedom and nothing else. Now his was only one year. Uh, yes, free from servitude. So one year, not so bad, um, but still got nothing after that one year other than his freedom. Indigenous labor. After Medicom's war, many of the surviving indigenous people became economically dependent on the colonists. Additionally, indigenous people were imported into New England from Spanish colonies, especially in the early 18th century. That's right, there were no longer even enough you know, native people here um, to enslave or indenture. In 1748, there were 807 whites, 134 Negroes, and 51 Indians living in Portsmouth. And again, these are words straight from the historical records. So. Uh, and that is over 5% of the population, 51. 
Um, I don't know if you can imagine that today. If there was all 5% Native American here in Portsmouth, that's almost 1,000 people, 900 people. Um, that would be quite amazing. Because unfortunately, as of right now, as far as we know, there are not any indigenous people living in Portsmouth. I wouldn't be surprised if there are, a few at least, but as of the 2020 census, whoever in, lived in Portsmouth in 2020 filled out that census, none of them, no one uh, mentioned that they were of indigenous um, heritage. In 1774, 54% of all indigenous peoples in Rhode Island were living with a white family. That means half the people, not including those at the reservation near Charlestown, so half of the indigenous people in Rhode Island were in some way indentured or fully enslaved. In Portsmouth alone, 100% of the 21 Native Americans live in a white household, which is, is it's very telling. If you look at all these other towns, you'll see Newport, maybe 80% are living in a white household, but 20% are living on their own in other towns as well. Portsmouth is one of the few that, oh no, <laughs> if, you're, if you're an Indian, you cannot be living here on your own. You must be in a white household. Really quick with these three maps. Um, a 1651 Dutch map on the left. I throw it up here just to show that even as of 1651 on Rhode Island, it was recognized that the Narragansetts lived here or that this was Narragansett land. Nahakans, that's I guess how you say Narragansett in Dutch. Uh, but by, and by 1675, it's very hard to see, but it says Pocono country on top. It says King Philip's country right there. So as of 1675, the start of uh, the war, that's still Poconoke uh, territory. But by 1690, those names are gone. This now says Mount Hope, and no mention of Narragansett's on the island. So it's kind of show how quickly um, that progressed. Now this, I'm actually just going to go through, over, I'm going to skip over this here, the Grand Inquisition into Indigenous Deaths, just to show that there were so many more connections with Portsmouth officials, with Portsmouth residents and Indigenous peoples. They, they, they created inquests every time someone died in the town and we didn't know how they died. And these men, and it's so official, very lengthy writing, um, a dozen men would be involved and they would go and view the body, and this is 350 years ago. They didn't know how these people died. If, they, if you couldn't see an actual gunshot um, or a stab, um, they always guessed that they drowned, <laughs> basically. <laughs> if an indigenous person was found by the water, they drowned. If there was any indication that that person had any alcohol at some point during that day, they were drunk and drowned. So let's kind of skip over that now. All right. Now we're on our last five to ten minutes, I promise. Uh, so this also was one of the impetus for me to kind of do this presentation today. So this is the story, uh, really quick, of the Indian servant that belonged to Mr. Giles Slocum. His name was Job, and they wrote his name J-O-B-E, so the Indian servant was Job. And here is what the Boston News leader wrote about this incident. On June 27, 1712, an Indian servant man belonging to Mr. Giles Slocum of Portsmouth carried out to sea in a canoe two of his master's sons, one of ten, the other of nine years old, whom he killed and drowned. And being examined before the authority, I love it, examined before the authority. I wonder how the authority examined this Indian to get him to what comes after that, after being examined, confessed that he knocked the eldest child in the head with the paddle, and seeing the younger crying, he designedly, intentionally, overset the canoe and swam ashore himself. He's now in irons in prison till he is tried for his murder. So this is what the media is saying about this incident. I wonder where they got this information from. They didn't get it from Job. Um, Job's in prison at this time. Job can't tell his story. If Job really confessed to this murder, then why did he plead not guilty? I, I don't have it in front of you, but I can certainly show it to you. Uh, he, he pled not guilty. And he then, uh, because of that, went to trial. Now at trial, he was found guilty. He was sentenced to be hanged with his body gibbeted. Um, he may have been executed by firing 
squad, but regardless, his body was displayed on the Antinomi Hill. So being gibbeted um, basically means his body was um, stuffed in an iron cage, um, hung and stuffed in an iron cage, so for all to see um, from the Antinomi Hill as a warning. Um, and at the time, you have to imagine there were no trees. So you could really see on top of Antinomi Hill from downtown Newport, probably from all over, um, at least uh, from the south end of the island. Last story. You guys are so great and so patient for sticking with me. Uh, so here's Jacob Mott Jr.'s farmhouse. So the Mott farmhouse, this picture was taken uh, probably around 1970. Uh, before the house was dismantled. And this was um, along West Main Road, basically where um, public house is now, the King's Grant. Um, not so much where public house is, more where the other buildings are in the middle. <laughs> and um, so right around this spot is where this incident happened. Now, I know many of the historians here, like Mr. Garman, knows that story about Joe Slocum, but I wonder if you guys have heard this story before. So I'm just going to read this really quick, and we'll be almost done. Indian lad named Peter, belonging to Jacob Mott Jr. of Portsmouth, did maliciously endeavor to murder his said master by discharging at him a gun, shooting him through the hat, so that it was an extraordinary act of providence said Mott was not killed. Inasmuch as there was only an intent of mischief, falls not under the law so that the said Indian may have afflicted on him the punishment equalizing the malignity of his crime, and this assembly having cause to think said Indian may have some accomplices, and that it may be of bad consequence ever to set him at large in this government again, do order that the said Indian lad named Peter shall be branded on the forehead with the letter R with a hot iron. Did they have to write that? I mean, how can you be branded with a cold iron? But anyways, and this is a good question. I'm going to get to that in just a second here. And be publicly whipped at a cart's tail throughout all of the most public corners and places of the town of Newport, as the justices of said town shall think fit to direct, not exceeding ten lashes in one place, and that the said Jacob Mott shall and hereby hath full power to sell and dispose of said Indian, named Peter, so that he be banished into some foreign port, never to have liberty of returning into this government again. So when I first read this a uh, while ago, I assumed Peter was young, maybe a 13-year-old kid, because we got the word lad and mischief. Um, and they determined that he wasn't trying to kill Jacob, that he's just fooling around, basically, with a musket. But since... This seems like a really English word to me, lad, and we all think of a lad being a boy. I decided to check the definition. And the second definition of lad is someone who works in the stables regardless of age. So do you remember another Peter I mentioned a little while ago? It could be the same one. So the Peter that was um, indentured to William Wardell in 1678 was born in 1664. Uh, uh, do the math with 5859. So in 1723, if it was the same Peter, he'd be about 5859. Uh, possible, you know, I don't know without, without more research. But that would be a, sort of an, a, a very sad fate for Peter having his childhood um, go from being free uh, with his people to being indentured to Mr. Wardell, to I assume other, other indentures, and now to Jacob Mott, um, and then for this incident to have happened. Again, in the end, the only thing that happened is Jacob Mott lost one bullet, a little bit of black powder, and a hat. Yet, this is, um, this is, this is Peter's, right, this is Peter's punishment, to be, to be branded, um, and also to be whipped. How many times? It could be, it could be one, it could be hundreds, because, because Portsmouth isn't saying how many. They're leaving it up to the officials of Newport. No more than 10 in, in each place, but how many places? The most popular, the most public corners? There's hundreds of corners in Newport. Which are ones are the most public? So don't know exactly how he was treated with that. I'll throw this in here. I'm telling you, I think there's, this is, I think there's only one more after this, and, and that. The Narragansett and the Warwick Indians, this is a quote from a Mr. Gookin, 1792, are an active, laborious, and ingenious people. 
which is demonstrated in their labors they do for the English, especially in making stone fences. My grandmother was right. So when I was a kid, I asked my grandma, where did all these stone walls come from? And she said, the Indians built that. Now, growing up, uh, I learned, no, that wasn't true at all. The, all these stone walls are from the colonists who, when they plowed the fields and they, they had to do something with the stones, they put them on the walls. Well, it could very well be that a lot of the stone walls here in Portsmouth were built by some of these Native Americans, but they were indentured or servants or enslaved at the time. And this is the final slide. It's just a few random quotes that just show some of the thoughts and feelings of some of the English toward them at the time. So direct from our 1663 Rhode Island Charter, poor ignorant Indian natives invade and destroy the native Indians. Granted, it's out of context, but that's all right. These are still the exact words from that. Um, for the terror of evil doers hereafter, that was from the Peter Mott case. And the Indians are gone, which is what our uh, Newport Historic Society said in 1912. But Max Scott, just last week, told me, no, we are still here. And that is it. <laughs> Thank you. Very quick questions and answers. You had a question, sir. Yeah, um, the, the punishment of him around the town, in England, they had an annual punishment and it was for boys, typically. It was called beating the bounds. Right. Yeah. And they would take people who deserved to be punished, and you would go to certain points on the bounds of your, of your town, like London, and they would be beaten at each one of those places. Okay. Later, it turned into a more symbolic thing where they simply beat the, um, uh, uh, the boundary stone. Right. But prior to that, it was a punishment for children, and they were beaten, beating the bounds, and it was a, an annual event. Oh. Sounds like fun, huh? <laughs> we got to bring it back. Yeah. Some unruly children. Yes, sir. Did you ever talk to any of the cassettes regarding the tribal areas? No, no. Because I... they are dead set against the masters. Okay, yes. There are, uh, is, unfortunately, a lot I of still conflict. I like question and I do a 17th century presentation also. Right. Uh, but I'm a reenactor, and I could have brought in a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, uh, no, I, I'd appreciate that. Um, I, I um, and the didn't quite have enough time to contact as many of the people yeah, as I wanted. But, but the mass peace aren't really well liked in the Native American or indigenous peoples uh, area. For, for mine and, and our purposes, I, I was you know, basically just using for example, the Wee Too, for example. So that would be something, whether Percasset, Narragansett, or Mashpee Wampanoag, that they would have used. We just did a presentation down here at State Park in, in uh, Boulder. Oh, nice. Last one. I'll have to get your contact information, sir. Yes. Uh, two quick questions. One, um, where is that museum that you referenced? The Mashpee? Museum? Yeah. Right, the it? Mashpee Wampanoag Museum. Yeah. Well, it's in Mashpee, um, exact address. To, oh, it's down there, Cape Cod. Yeah. Well, way before Cape Cod, yeah. Uh, what town was it there? You remember? Yeah, Mashpee, right, that's what I said. It's near Dennis. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's on the Bristol. And you're right in Bristol, Warren. You're right in Warren, aren't you? I'm in Warren. And there's also the, uh, there's flyers up here about discovering songs. Um, that has a lot of really good information. The Stones Heritage Area is right in the Any other questions? The, uh, the, oh. the uh, <laughs> memorial, the wall down at, you know, with the battle of Rhode Island, mm -hmm. uh, the first black regiment. Have you ever gone down there and read some of the names That's on there? They look like a lot of uh, indigenous folks. Right, right. Um, it, in, indigenous people were allowed to, to join uh, the First Rhode Island Regiment along with um, um, black people at the time. As you can see, I already was overwhelmed with so much information and, and I knew I had to cut it off <laughs> way before I got to that. But yes, good point. Back there. Um, I was going to just comment on the 1652 
slavery law. Sure. Which, if you read it carefully, applies only to white and black. And that's not an accident because, as you know, uh, there are many ways of interpreting that law. But one is that it mentions uh, basically a, a, a bondage. Uh, they cannot be enslaved through, uh, I can't remember the, term, the terminology, basically bondage, uh, a bondage agreement. Uh, it excludes purposely, to my knowledge, uh, Native Americans because of the practice of the, of the British uh, conquering in just wars. Anybody, uh, anybody that's conquered in a just war can be taken sure. as a slave. And this goes way back. Everything, everything you talked about today goes back to Europe. It's okay. not people, we, we've lost the connection to the European history, so we don't understand all these terms. But uh, the preventing, preventing slavery of black, um, you know, what they call Negro and white at the time, was purposely uh, excluding Native Americans because the practice already existed of enslaving Native Americans, and the European concept of just wars allowed you to enslave the, the captive. Um, the other thing to note about that is that was passed in province plantations. It wasn't passed in Rhode Island. No, not, I know, right? It was, that, it was not one colony. So Right, at that time it yeah, was, as time. I mentioned, and then um, when it, they did merge Ports with the Newport was separate from province of Warwick at that one those couple of years. Yeah. So. so so I mean it, there were other acts that didn't make it into the co colony of Rhode Island province right. plantations. That was one of them. We have time for one more question over here and then I just oh. have to help with two, two oh, more. Two more. Two more. Okay. Go, go ahead, you were up first. <laughs> yes. uh, I noticed, uh, I mean, you pointed to the map where it says Poconoke country, right. the, the map, solar map of 1675. But uh, have you had contact with the Poconokes? And the chief lives in Yes, yes, no, I, I absolutely know. I wasn't, uh, I did not get the time to contact them as well. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is a somewhat different story from their point of view, as there is from every tribe. Exactly, exactly. And that's why I've encouraged everyone, if you're really that interested in any one of these tribes, to contact them directly. Uh, I, my, my intent is the only thing I could do is really base this lecture on the English records themselves. And I can't stress that enough. These are biased documents. We all have our biases. We all do it. Um, you know, we all want to make ourselves look, look good. And so if you want their side of the story, the Poconote side, if you want the Narragansett side, if you want the uh, Picasso side, you really need to contact them directly. Last question. Well, I just want to make a comment. I recently found out five years ago when I became a grandfather that I have a ancestor that was Native American and I only to find out <laughs> that the ancestor was Adam Ma, oh. son of John. And I also know that from my maternal side that I'm uh, a descendant of um, Adam Bullock Ma, who fought in the Civil War, thank goodness, for the Union <laughs> and for the 1st Regiment. And he, his, his dad, I believe, was Samuel Mott, and he supplied, he, he ran a schooner, and would stop at the Mott family farm, and stop at the coal and supply, and supply Block Island. And so that's what he did. Um, and I'm glad to say that I think in, when other ancestors of other people in Bristol, which is big into slavery, they no longer had any slaves. Now, to be clear, I don't think that Adam Mott Sr. or Jr. had enslaved any people. It wasn't until Jacob Mott Jr. Okay, but I don't know. I'm not going to have to come back from Florida, actually. But I'm Rhode Island and grew up in Rhode Island. And in fact, I lived in a condo that was great. I brought your dog. Nice. Could very well be. I mean, first there were many Jacob Mots. You're, you're going to get so confused when you start looking at all these spots. <laughs> right. 
and I and I know we're running um, long here tonight, but there is the story of the Indian, the Portsmouth Indian Princess, which, as we all know, the in, uh, Native Americans didn't use that term. But in the 1670s, a, a little girl by the name of uh, Minitinka Gassaset became an orphan. They're trying to tie her and make her to be the daughter of uh, Massasoit, which he would have been around 70 years old if you do the marriage records. Well, she was orphaned, and because she was an, uh, the daughter of Chief Gassaset, is what we think, um, she wasn't endangered. She was taken into the home of a prominent Quaker. The prominent Quaker, they believe, is Giles Slocum. She married John Corey of Corey Farms, Corey, and had about nine or ten children. Then they ended up moving over to North Kingstown. But I always think if there are some Cory people who do a DNA test <laughs> and they come up with Native American on Ancestry.com, it could be the Portsmouth Princess. And they changed her, uh, they, English, uh, they gave her the name of Elizabeth, so she became Elizabeth Cory. My father's first cousin is descended from her, and she's very disappointed that she didn't have Native American in her DNA because there is a distinct paper trail that goes back in the records. It's kind of urban legend. Um, because nobody can really say, but if you if you Google it, you'll you'll find her. I know, I know. It, yeah. So, and I don't mean to cut you off. It is really getting late, and I wanted to say this. First of all, thank you, Stephen. That was wonderful. Um,